I uh, have done two startups, as Paul said. One worked and one did not. But both ended kind of in grim fashion for me. Um, the first one, uh, the street.com, took place during a period that is now called the uh, Internet 1.0 era, which for some of you in school might have been when you were born. But it was a very exciting time back then. Uh, the internet, just to give you some perspective, when I first got into journalism in 1993, or it was 1990, but in 1993, uh, there was a bombing at the World Trade Center in February. I worked across the street at the Wall Street Journal. It was a Friday. At the time, the Wall Street Journal didn't publish on Saturday. I called down to the news desk and I said, I'm ready to go out and cover this story. And they said, it's Friday, we don't publish till Monday, we'll just take the AP on Monday morning. Because there was no internet. There was no way to publish anything in 1993. That changed in 1993, 94, when the internet began, began to become commercialized. And I dove headfirst into the, the internet 1.0 era. It was a time of great excitement. It was this, you know, Amazon was just starting. Uh, companies like Yahoo were just starting. There was an old company called AOL that was just starting. Companies that don't exist like Netscape just starting. And I drove headlong into it, and for five years, I was completely immersed in what was happening uh, in the digital age, the early parts of the digital age. Fortunes were being made overnight, company models being destroyed. It was um, very exciting and very heady. And then it all came to an end in the summer of 2001 when the internet, they call it the internet bubble burst. Um, and I remember the last day I was at thestreet.com, it was five years of intense work. I went with a group of colleagues to uh, Morton Steakhouse in downtown Manhattan. It was destroyed in later that year and is no longer there. Um, but we had the, what we called the Last Supper. And we talked about the last five years and what we had done to pioneer new forms of journalism, to take on the Wall Street Journal, to take on the New York Times, all the exciting things we'd done, all the talent that we had gathered together. And we toasted that moment. And then I went home, and it was July 1st, 2001. And I woke up the next morning, and I realized I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a computer. There was no furniture in my apartment because I had never had time to buy any. <laughs> and I just sat there and said, what happened? these last five years. It was almost like emerging from a coma or some kind of weird out-of-body experience. I literally, it felt like I had done nothing but that job for five straight years. And I began to take stock of what that meant. And I'm going to talk more about what led up to that Last Supper and that morning of reckoning. But I want to just talk about some of our themes for today. We're going to talk about when your startup stops. I'm going to talk very importantly about restarting. I'm going to talk about lessons learned, and then on a personal note, talk about coming home and what that means. Now, as Paul's probably shared with you, if you've had him as a professor in class, there's something special about growing up in the Midwest. You long to go somewhere else, generally. <laughs> you watch TV shows that are in LA or New York City or maybe Chicago once in a while, but seldom about Minnesota. And growing up in Minnesota, I always knew I wanted to be a journalist. It's a funny thing. I, I love sports. I wanted to be a sportscaster, maybe a sports writer. I went to college in Minnesota initially because I wanted to play college football. And you can see how big and hulking I am. And that maybe wasn't the best idea. I understand you have a professor here from St. Thomas who does look like he could play college football, uh, a guy named Brian. Uh, I was the smallest guy in my team. I barely ever played. It wasn't really that great a team to begin with. And so I decided in my freshman year of college that I really, it's time to grow up, time to be a journalist. And I decided the way to do that was just to go to New York. If I can get to New York, I can become a journalist. Naive, perhaps, a little. So I applied to some schools in New York, and I got into Columbia. I couldn't believe I, I got into Columbia. Little did I know at the time, it had just gone co-ed, and they were desperate for people from the Midwest. <laughs> so I was kind of an original affirmative action student coming to Columbia. And um, I remember that it said on my application, it said, you're accepted, but we can't guarantee you housing. Now, I had been on a plane for the first time in my life the year before. I had never been to New York. 
I knew I had a friend at Princeton, and so I looked at the map, and they looked close together. <laughs> and I figured if I didn't have housing, I would just take the train. I'd sleep on his floor, and I'd take the train up from Princeton to go to, go to college. So I get to Columbia for my, <coughs> excuse me, my, my mid-year orientation, or my, the mid-year transfer orientation, it, unlike many big college orientations, which are filled with balloons and parties, this was two hours in a windowless classroom. And at the end, I raised my hand. I was a Pell Grant student. And I asked, how does my financial aid change if I don't have a dorm? And someone leaned over, 20 of us in the room, he leaned over, tapped me on the shoulder, said, oh, you must be Dave Kansas, apparently the only one on financial aid. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, he said, we do have a dorm for you, so you're OK. I went up to the dorm that day. It was the biggest room I had ever s lived in in my life, this dorm. I thought it was a mistake. I immediately left town so that they couldn't find out that I wasn't supposed to be in this big room. Came back on Saturday night, and I decided that classes were going to start on Tuesday. I decided on Sunday morning I was going to go to church, because that's what a good Christian boy does. He goes to church the first day. so. I walked around the neighborhood of Columbia. There was a Presbyterian church. I grew up Presbyterian uh, at 114th and Broadway, Broadway Presbyterian. And I went to the church service, and I stayed there. And then, just to, to show you how Midwestern I really am, at the end of the service, I went up to the pastor, Scott Matheny, and introduced myself. And he said, well, why are you here? He said, well, I'm in New York because I'm going to become a journalist. I am going to get a job here, and I'm going to be successful. And I mean, classes hadn't even started, right? I mean, I've been in my dorm. And he said, well, that's really quite refreshing to hear from some Midwestern kids. So he introduced me to the dean of the college. And I met the dean of the college the very next day. Robert Pollack was his name. He was a scientist, a biologist, and he hated events. And he said, I understand, young man, you want to be a journalist. And I said, well, yes, I do. And he said, well, here are two tickets tonight to the Columbia DuPont Journalism Awards at Lowe Library at Columbia. Now, this, I didn't realize, was a big deal. I didn't really have much of a suit. I had an old uh, blazer with the plastic gold buttons, Mickey Mouse tie. You know, that's, that was about what I had in the wardrobe. And so I went to this event. I walked in, and there was Peter Jennings and uh, Ted Koppel and... Brian Williams and all these famous, you know, Barbara Walters, all these famous television journalists who are perhaps a little too old for you all to remember, but many, many big names. And I'm standing there, and a gentleman named Kevin Roach walks up to me at the bar and says, oh, do you go to school here? And I said, oh, yes, I do. And he says, do you work at the radio station? And I was like, well, I am going to work at the radio station. <laughs> So I said, yes, I work at the radio station. He said, here's my card. Give me a call. We're looking for some people to work at NBC Radio Network News. So I proceeded to call him every week for seven weeks until he relented and had me down to visit uh, their office, which is across the street from the Ed Sullivan Theater in Times Square. Um, and at the time, was owned by General Electric. And uh, he said, we have a job for you. You can answer the phones from midnight to 8 in the morning, five days a week. And I'm like, well, I'm in school. He said, well, what time does class start? And I said, 9. He said, shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> so that was my first job in journalism, answering the phone from midnight to 8 in the morning. And let me tell you, going to Times Square, that area back then in the late 80s, that was no Disneyland, I'll tell you right now. Um, but I always prided myself in, in having grit, determination. Right, I was naive enough to come to New York to think I can get a journalism job. Here I was working for a national news organization inside of two months of getting to New York. I remember working as a camp counselor with a group of campers. We were in the Sierra Nevadas. And the leaders had given each group a bucket. And it was called the anxiety bucket or something like that. And each of the sub-leaders went out with a group to go camping, hiking for three or four days. And they said, when you're really at the end of your rope, you can open the bucket and have what's inside. In my group, we'd get, down, we'd get upset. I'd say, oh, come on, come on. We want to save that bucket till the end. You want to be happy that you never opened that bucket till the very end, so then you can just really enjoy it. Well, we got to the end. We never opened the bucket, and there were cookies that had become crumbs. And it just, <laughs> so it's like, so I was a little twisted, I guess is what I'm trying to tell you. 
So I was at NBC Radio. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a very, one of my best friends I made um, in that job was a guy I met while sleeping during uh, halfway through my 9 o'clock class. Um, you know, because I'd get done at 8, I'd take the subway back up to Columbia, I'd have class at 9, 9 to 11, there was a midway break, and I would just pass out on the couch outside the classroom, and a guy named Paul Greenberg knocked me in the head one time and said, why are you always sleeping? And I said, well, I work from midnight to 8 in the morning. He said, you're insane. Um, so we're <laughs> still good friends to this day. Uh, it was a union job, so I went on strike in a couple of months after I started, which was kind of an interesting education on how the world works. Um, <laughs> And I went back to Minnesota to become a camp counselor. So every summer I'd go home, camp counselor, church camp. I've been a church camp goer since I was in third grade. I was the waterfront director. And it was always a fascinating thing. On a Friday afternoon, I'd leave New York City, fly back to the Midwest, arrive at dark, and drive up to this camp in Wisconsin on Lake Mud Hen. And it would be dark. And the next morning, I would wake up in you know rural America, you know, whereas in when it was light before, I was in mayhem, and then camp. And I did that for three summers. Um, and after I went on strike for, at NBC, when I came back to school, uh, they broke the union, long story, I went back to NBC. But my senior year, NBC folded, NBC radio, folded into a, a radio outfit called Mutual, and I got a job at New York Newsday as a, as a regular dead tree print journalist. It was about at the same time that I started going to a church uh, that was meeting in the Upper West Side of Manhattan at a Seventh-day Adventist church. Seventh-day Adventist being on Saturday, of course, so this church met on Sunday. It was Redeemer Presbyterian Church. There were about, well, I don't know, 100, and 100 people there maybe. Tim Keller was the pastor. Um, and it was an incredible experience. I sang in the choir, got to know people. Um, it was a wonderful grounding for me because I had really struggled to find a great church in around Columbia Broadway. I worked at West End Presbyterian, 105th in Amsterdam. But this, uh, in 1989, was a, was a, was a great church. Um, going back to the career side, I was still in school, still working full-time. In fact, I was making so much money uh, working while full-time in school that I lost my Pell Grant. Uh, I was too rich now, apparently, from working all this time. And New York Newsday was a, an experiment of Long Island Newsday that started in the 90s to try to create a newspaper for New York uh, uh, that ended badly, but it was going great when I was there. Uh, and I covered high school, college, and sports, which is if you're from another part of the country, the best way to learn about New York City is to cover high school, college, and sports. Because if you got to go to uh, Bishop Farrell in Staten Island or Jefferson High School in uh, Brooklyn, or uh, Riverside in the Bronx, or Jackson in Queens. You got to figure out where it is. You got to figure out how to get there. You got to figure out how to get there safely, and how to get back home and write your story and file it. And I did that job for um, a couple of years after graduation. I did have a brief foray. Paul told me not to talk about this, but I tried to become a professional singer. <laughs> Ginny Pike here, who helped me with my non-professional singing, uh, later in life, I, I uh, was in an a cappella group in college, and there was a guy at Tufts, uh, and Tufts was the a cappella kind of acme, the high point of all a cappella music. In fact, if you ever watch Glee, it was the Tufts college group that played the boys group in the TV show. And this guy, Deke Sharon, who has now become like the godfather of all a cappella, asked four guys to come to San Francisco with him to do a cappella singing in the summer after I graduated. And uh, it didn't work out, so we won't go into any more of that. Uh, it was a lot of fun. They got rid of me, reformed the house jacks. They sing. They got a Tommy Boy record deal. It's pretty awesome. But I was destined to be a journalist. So I was at um, Newsday after I graduated, covering high school, college, and sports. And I had uh, the job I had was a really uh, twisted job. It was 34 and a half hours a week, so I had no benefits. Um, that was on purpose. The only time I had benefits was if I was in a bicycle race because the United States Cycling Federation required me to buy insurance on the side to race bicycles. And my mother, who was always quite concerned, said, what are you going to do if you get sick? I said, well, I'll go to the start of a bicycle race, <laughs> and I will fall over on my bike and go, oh, I'm hurt, and the insurance will cover me. <laughs> it never did come to that. But I did start to uh, figure out a deal at Newsday. I worked from 3.30 to uh, 10.30 almost every day. 
And then in the morning, I'd go in at 9 o'clock. I figured out I could freelance to all other parts of the paper. So I basically worked from 9 till about 11 at night. And by May of 1991, I'm out of college, done with my singing career. I have the most bylines in the fifth largest paper in America. I'm fighting with the cops reporter. Cops reporters always have a lot of bylines. And I get called, I've worked in Queens, and I get called to the home office in Manhattan to meet Rich Gale, the managing editor. And I'm like, I'm going to get a full-time job. I am set. I didn't have to go to Florida. I didn't have to go to Alabama. I didn't have to go to Minnesota. I got a real journalism job by staying in Manhattan. And I get there, and they said, well, you're doing a great job. You got your part-time freelance stuff you're doing, your freelance stuff you're doing and the part-time sports thing you're doing. And the unions filed a grievance against you saying that it should be a full-time job, so you get to choose. You can do one or the other. It's up to you. And so, of course, I quit. Um, and I took a job at the Wall Street Journal as a proofreader, which was a long way down from what I had been doing before. But I had read and heard that the Wall Street Journal promoted people from within, including people from the Midwest. So I was quite optimistic about that. So I worked at the Wall Street Journal for uh, five years. And then in the summer of 1996, <coughs> the internet started exploding. I was, uh, despite all my glorious journalism, quite massively still in debt. I had, had to borrow a lot of money for college. I had kind of lived without a job during the singing career, short-lived though it was. And I was kind of focused on, if I stayed a journalist my whole life, I would probably pay off my school debt and my credit card debt you know, by the time I was 50, which is two weeks from now. Um, and so I was really focused on that when these guys came to me in the summer of 1996 and they said, we're starting this thing on the internet. And I, you know, I had gotten one of the first email addresses at the Wall Street Journal. It was pipeline.net. Uh, the journal had just gone online. It was still a very mysterious thing. At the Wall Street Journal, when the internet was first brought into the newsroom, they had a special computer that sat in the middle of the newsroom because everybody was scared that something bad was in there. <laughs> and you had to walk across the room to go on the computer that was connected to the internet to use it. So it was a lot of mystery, a lot of questions. You know, what is this thing? What will it do? And if you think about it, it's really not that long ago, but it was like a foreign country. So I was working at the Wall Street Journal, one of the greatest papers in the world. I was a reporter. I had a great job. I could walk into any cocktail party and say, I work at the Wall Street Journal. And they go, oh, the Wall Street Journal. That's pretty exciting. And these people came to me and said, Let's, you should try to do something totally new and totally different. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. No, I don't want to do it. No, I don't want to do it. And then a friend of a friend knew some of these guys who were trying to invest in this, said they're desperate. They're, they're going to not do this thing if you don't say yes. They need somebody from some journalistic entity. Otherwise, it's a waste of their time. So I went home. I did the math. I figured out what would I need to do to pay off all my debts in three months by Christmas of 96, because I figured it'd be out of business in six months. And then what would I be doing? So I came back to them, and I, and I said, well, here's, here's my number, 3x what I was making at the Wall Street Journal. And they said, done. And we'll even give you some equity. And I said, what's equity? <laughs> <coughs> I said, thank you very much. So at this point in my life, I had lived, you see this air shafts and cockroaches? I had only lived in apartments where I had an air shaft room or they were filled with cockroaches or both. So I wasn't in debt because I was splurging on a giant apartment in Tribeca. It was just like being a journalist is hard. You got to like really hustle for everything that you do. So I was thinking about this offer, and I went to Lake George with some friends. And I remember looking up at the clouds. Has anybody been to Lake George? And I remember I, remember I was just deep in prayer, because I was scared about leaving the comfort of the Wall Street Journal to go to something that I had to explain for six minutes to tell them what it was. I was always using, you know, every journalist really most journalists, their goal in life is to get to the biggest, safest place they can brag about, really. New York Times, Washington Post. And I was going to leave one of those places and go to something that really didn't exist. But I really felt in that time of prayer and reflection, I remember it still to this day, standing in the lake. It was like 
you should just go. What have you got to lose? You're 29, you're single. If it doesn't work, you can just do something else. And it was very comforting and very reassuring. So I went to thestreet.com, and startup life is really fascinating. If you've ever worked for a big company and your phone's not working, you send an email to somebody, and they come and they fix your phone. If you work at a big company and your computer's not working or it breaks, you call somebody and they come and they replace your computer. I walked into, so I'd worked at NBC, General Electric. I'd worked at New York Newsday, which is part of Times Mirror. I'd worked at the Wall Street Journal, part of Dow Jones. And I walked into an abandoned bank vault with phone lines strewn across the ground with computers of mismatching boxes and phones that didn't work. And nobody had the same business card if they had a business card at all. It was September of 1996. And I went there for two days, and I came in the third day, and I said, I just, I can't take it. I need to take some time off after two days. <laughs> so I left, went away for three days, came back. And we were supposed to start publishing by November. Our staff at that time was three people, including a college graduate, someone who'd worked in Denver, a woman from Yale. I mean, it was a, it was a very small operation, so part of my job was to hire people. And you'd go out and recruit people, and you'd say, I want you to come work for this thing. And they'd be, what is this thing? And you'd have to explain this thing, and they wouldn't understand what you're talking about. <sighs> so I, a lot of the early days was trying to find people. And this, if you ever do an entrepreneurial thing or a startup, especially in a known industry, go looking for people who feel like they've had their last shot. Made a misstep. Did something wrong. They are talented but headstrong. Or... Uh, someone didn't like him in it, it went the sideways for him, but they're so eager, so eager to prove the people who put them on the sideline that they were wrong. I remember one guy in particular, and we, and we brought in incredible talent to the street.com. This one guy, Jesse Isinger, worked for the Dow Jones News Service. Jesse was brilliant, but Jesse knew he was brilliant and told everyone he was brilliant and became uns insufferable. And so he'd been kind of put in a backwater over at Dow Jones and wasn't going anywhere. We hired him, made him very prominent, and I'm happy to say that I think it was three years ago he won a Pulitzer Prize working for ProPublica, which was at the time just across the street here. Alex Berenson, who was a cocky young reporter who had worked in Denver, uh, ended up at the, left the street.com to go to the New York Times and now is a very successful thriller writer. Next time you're in the airport, look for Alex Berenson. And you'll see a lot of his books. Today I met, had coffee with a woman named Jamie Heller. She's a top editor at the Wall Street Journal now. Adam Lashinsky, top columnist at Fortune. Herb Greenberg, you've probably seen him on CNBC if you watch CNBC. Gail Griffin runs uh, Barron's Online. I mean, we had this great array of talent that was so fun to work with. Um, that was probably the best part of, of building a company from scratch. You can, you can create your own culture. You can create, you know, if you want a culture where people don't cuss all the time, you can create that culture. If you want a culture where people are respectful and edifying, you can create that culture. That's one of the beauties of entrepreneurship. The huge risk is it might not work. But you have so much authority over what kind of culture is created. One of the challenges to our culture is we had two owners who were quite mercurial. A guy named Jim Cramer. Has anybody heard of Jim Cramer? <laughs> CNBC, yeah. That's the sedated version that you see on television. <laughs> uh, and a guy named Marty Peretz, who at the time owned the New Republic and was his own kind of crazy. Um, and I remember we brought in um, uh, venture capitalists. We'd, we'd started in 96, 97, 98. 98, the venture capitalists started to come in. And my first meeting I'll never forget with the, with the venture capitalist was, um, I s he said, what's your hardest question? I'm, so I'm trying to figure out who to hire or how many people to hire. And he said to me, well, what's your budget? And I said, well, I don't know. I just hire people. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, that's quite an early stage investment for us. Um, it was not, we were not really a, a traditional operation. So they were about to put in $10 million into our company that would have made us a real company. I mean, a real company with a board of directors and the whole thing. And at the time, um, Jim Cramer and Marty Peretz, the two mercurial owners, were not talking. Um, and the investment was coming late, and we had payroll to hit. So I called up 
Jim Cramer's hedge fund partner, Jeff Berkowitz, who I didn't know that well. And I said, Jeff, how's it going? He goes, pretty good. You remember I'm like 30 years old. And I said, how's it going? He's, oh, I'm pretty good. And I said, hey, I need to borrow $425,000 just for a couple of days. <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, well, if I don't get $425,000 from you, I can't make payroll. And then we're really in a lot of trouble. And, and so, so he said to me, I need to talk to my wife. <laughs> so he calls his wife. And then he calls me. I said, OK, you sure you can pay me back? It was, I felt like wimpy. You sure you can pay me back Tuesday for a hamburger today? And I said, yes, I can pay you back. And so he, he lent, me, lent me the $425,000, and we made payroll. And it's always a great question to ask somebody, have you ever had to make a call like that to borrow? That's a real entrepreneur's moment, right? You have to d just do something audacious and nuts. Uh, ask somebody who you barely know for almost a half million dollars. Um, I should uh, tell you that uh, this was a, a crazy time, you know, asking for $400,000, all different things. Two of my favorite books are O Pioneers by Willa Cather. Who's read that? Anybody? I mean, Scott definitely had from North Dakota. Yeah. It's about, you know, being young, tough, and gritty in the plains as a young woman. And The Great Gatsby. You know The Great Gatsby? Who's read that? Right? So The Great Gatsby protagonist is Nick Carraway. Nick Carraway grew up in St. Paul. I grew up in St. Paul. <laughs> Nick Carraway came to New York. I came to New York. Nick Carraway got caught up in the crazy 20s. I got caught up in the crazy 90s. <laughs> Nick Carraway ran into all kinds of crazy people and was involved. He ran across the guy who rigged the World Series. He, you know, great bootleggers. I mean, there's all kinds of just this weird life for Nick Carraway, who came from that small town in the Midwest. Well, that was kind of like my life in the late 90s. Uh, Jim Cramer, you know, he was a larger than life figure. His, you know, Still pretty larger than life. Roger Ailes used to run Fox News. We had, we had the first business show on Fox News. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, I remember sitting across from Rupert Murdoch while he had a big yellow pad in his hands. And I was across the desk trying to sell him the street.com. And he was like, eh, Dad, I don't think so, you know, in his Australian <laughs> accent, you know. We wrote, I wrote a book called The Street.com Guide to Investing in the Internet Age. It was number one on Amazon. And then we had an IPO. Uh, that uh, made me the $9 million man. I was on the cover of the New York Times business section. Dave Kansas, rich, a journalist, crazy. Journalists aren't supposed to get rich. And um, it was a really weird, fantastical time. I mean, there's so many stories. I mean, I remember Jim Cramer came into the office one day, and the rules of the road were Jim Cramer could never come into the office. And he comes into the office, and he fires somebody. And the rules of the road, Jim Cramer couldn't fire anybody. And so I resigned on the spot. And he begged me overnight to come back. And I had a bunch of demands, like he could never come into the office, he couldn't fire people. And I did come back. But it was just, it was, it was, it was almost unreal. Can you work 100 hours per week? Jim Cramer wanted me to be answering his emails at 6 in the morning. Didn't expect me to go back home until 8 or 9 at night. That included the weekends. He slept three hours a night. He, I remember it got so crazy that I, I love the opera. And when I had the money, I bought a subscription to the Metropolitan Opera. And I brought it for Friday nights because I knew that was the only way I would leave the office. If I knew I had to be at the Met at 8 o'clock, I would leave at 7.45 or something like that. <laughs> but what was also happening was that a lot of things that were core to my being. I remember talking about you know church camp counselor, redeemer, fellowship, those things were washing away. I wasn't going to church. I wasn't in fellowship. I wasn't praying. I was all consumed with what this fantastical land had become. I was losing touch with friends and family. We opened an office in London. So I was in London one week out of every four. We talked about global domination. But it was really hard to see when you're in the center of the storm just how all-consuming it can be. But then, you know, if a thing can't go on forever, as a great economist once said, it won't. And the internet bubble, the first one, the 1 1.0, which ended with some companies that would make you laugh today. You know, pets.com is worth a bajillion dollars. And, you know, you could, anyway, it was like, it was, it was, it was a crazy time. In the fall of 2000, the bubble starts to burst. Market starts to fall. I personally had uh, a bunch of stock. Uh, 
And I went to my accountant and I said, I want to buy this apartment. Uh, it was a beautiful apartment. I never really, you know, I had still, was still living in air shafts and cockroaches. And so I said, you know, the stock was trading at about you know, 20 bucks. And he said, well, if you buy that apartment, you should be fine if the stock doesn't get any lower than $8. So I went and bought a 2,800 square foot loft in Tribeca, which was amazing. You could have set up an archery firing range down the middle. It was one of those things where the elevator opens up into your place, you know, the key, that whole thing, like in the movies. So about eight months after buying this place, when the stock was at 90 cents, I was in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> I had margin calls. We were laying people off. I remember you know, we'd hired all these people. We had people scattered all over the country, all over the world working for us. And in the fall of 2000, I remember I flew out to San Francisco to close the San Francisco Bureau, took the red eye back to New York to lay off 26 people in New York. And in the spring of 2001, I'm in Maui on vacation. And I get a call, I said, we've got to cut 40 more. And I said, put my name at the top of the list. And then it all ended, the Last Supper. All that fantastical life, emerging the next day thinking, where do I get a computer? Where do I get a phone? Where do all my friends go? What time is church on Sunday? Where was God? Really the question was, where was I? And I, it came at a really interesting time. I didn't have a job. I had a $10,000 monthly mortgage, which even today sounds like a lot of money. And it was a real lot of money in 2001. And then uh, September 11th happened, right? I, I lived 10 blocks from the Trade Center. I heard the first plane go over my apartment. I heard it hit the tower. I went down there and watched people fall. Um, watched the second, I didn't actually, I was to the north, so the second plane actually came from the south. All I saw was a fireball. Um, and I went to church. I, anybody here heard of David Bisgrove? David Bisgrove works at, I think he's still at Redeemer. I haven't. He and I used to sing together, Ginny. Did you know that? Um, went to church after September 11th, met with him, and I kind of like just laid out all my frustrations, all my failings, all my concerns about where everything had gone, right up to and including 9-11. I was angry about, about that. And he talked with me and prayed with me, and we talked about fellowship. We talked about, you know, I had, uh, had the arrogance to think that I could – maintain a faithful walk without fellowship. I had been arrogant to think that I could do that without you know, having uh, being in a church or being in quiet time, prayer. And he was holding me accountable to that and then directed me toward a guy named John Mason who was just arrived from Australia and was starting an Anglican church with the help of Redeemer. Um, and it was called Christ Church. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Christ Church. Um, but I was involved in the start. It was a start, my, my third startup, uh, Christ Church. Um, and it was uh, a great experience. It got me grounded, got me back in to a rebuilding mode, fellowship, prayer, Bible study. I was in a Bible study with Paul and some others here, a journalist Bible study that John McCandlish Phillips led. And I was very grateful for that. I, I always knew him as John. And then you read about him like in Wikipedia or in a clip, and, and they just kind of lose his first name all the time, I guess, because of his byline. And he was a wonderful guy. He knew the craft. He knew, he knew what it was like to uh, be a believer in a secular environment, how you, how you needed to uh, be true to your faith but not expect that everyone to understand everything that you're thinking about or the language that you, but, that you might use, and learning to talk to people in a language they would understand. Um, I think about um, one of the phrases that I like to use is, I'm a Christian is the same as saying I'm left-handed. It's not like some big proclamation, but it's just something of who you are. And when you're in a secular environment, especially the national journalism environment, which is not terribly friendly to people of faith generally, Christians in particular, you have to have the ability to speak in the language and nomenclature of that culture to be effective. And I ultimately went back to the Wall Street Journal. And I was the money investing editor. And one of my favorite stories of that time was 
I was what they call the acting money and investing editor. And here's some advice. Don't ever be the acting anything if you can help it. It's really not that fun. It's better to be the thing as opposed to the acting. But if you are ever the acting, just pretend that you are the real thing. And in that year, uh, there was a big battle between the New York Stock Exchange and the Wall Street Journal. We were writing these stories about the executives of the, Wall, of the New York Stock Exchange. And it was a very bitter, multi-month, uh, very public spat battle, the whole thing. And uh, I remember the two lead journalists, this woman Kate Kelly, this woman Suzanne Craig, were nervous and scared because they were being personally attacked by the New York Stock Exchange, a very powerful and important institution. And I pulled out the Bible from my desk and looked at them. And everybody kind of knew that I had the Bible around and went to church and stuff like that. They kind of tried to pretend they didn't know. And I said, here's one for you. I said, oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Goes on and goes on and goes on. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. And I got to tell you, my two non-church-going journalist friends loved that. <laughs> They just felt like in that moment we were sharing something about, you know, there is justice, uh, that the lies won't deter us. That it was a shared thing that we all had from our different perspectives. I remember my boss at the time, a guy named Paul Steiger, who started ProPublica, um, had lunch with me at the end of that first year after all that stuff with the New York Stock Exchange. And he said, how did that, uh, how did that go? How was your first year in your opinion? And I saw it was great. He, and he looked at me and he said, I didn't think you were going to make it. <laughs> so I said, what? He said, yeah, that was pretty bad, the New York Stock Exchange thing. I said, yeah, but we were fine. We had the Psalms. Um, all right. Uh, moving on. Um, I'll skip over this. We moved to London, by the way, after I got married. And our son was born there. I will tell you a quick story about meeting my wife. One of the hardest things for me living in New York was trying to find someone. And I'll never forget, we, we rode bikes for six weeks. That's how we dated. We rode bikes together. And we were riding in Central Park on the east side when she told me where she went to church. And I was like, oh, wow, I found someone who goes to church. I can get married now. So we're married. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I talked to you about uh, The Great Gatsby. Uh, if, if you've read it as many times as I have, and you have any connection to the Midwest, you'll we will remember toward the end he talks about his favorite memories and it was about taking a train home at Christmas time and holding tickets in his hand and comparing invitations and feeling the snow fall down and, and he, he saying that's his Middle West, not the lost Swede towns or the prairies, but the thrilling returning trains of his youth and the sleigh bells. And he remarks that the story of Great Gatsby was about the West and about he Daisy, Gatsby, Jordan were all of the West, and that somehow they had some subtle deficiency that made them perhaps not quite adaptable to Eastern life. And I always held that in my head in the 20 some years I was out East, because I was always fighting it, loving it, fighting it, loving it, and ultimately decided that it was time to go home. And I'm really glad that I did. Moved home in 2011 to work at American Public Media, which, as Paul said, is where I am today. Got a great family. My dad just turned 81, set a swimming record in his age group the week before. My mom just turned 80. Uh, my in-laws just moved to St. Paul, which is, of course, as you know, the Brooklyn of the Twin Cities. Um, got a good church uh, and a good job, and it's really exciting. And, and it's made me reflect on the lessons of the startups that I did that worked and didn't, or didn't work at all. And talking with my pastor in Minnesota, he, he's talked to me a lot about idols. We think about idols, and we think about the Old Testament and things like that. But he said, no, what's most important? Is, it, is your job the most important thing? Is working 100 hours a week the most important thing? Where, where Look for your idols. Are they where you want them to be? Priorities. 
probably a good reason I didn't get married till I was 41, because I really didn't have that as a priority. I didn't have building a family as a priority. Fellowship suffered when I didn't make that a priority. Same with quiet time. And I think the most important thing to think about when you're in New York is accountability. Who is holding you accountable? Because this is a city great with anonymity. You can do a lot of things here and nobody will know, or at least you think they won't. So who's holding you accountable? Because you can't do it by yourself. A couple lessons from New York I just want to share and we'll wrap up here quickly. Um, Tim Keller once said to me, how do you feel about money and how do you feel about power? And I said, money terrifies me and I'm very comfortable with power. And he said to me, very few people are comfortable with both and you have to figure out what you're comfortable with and find ways to hold yourself accountable for what you're not comfortable with. John Mason um, was a great, uh, for me, was a great pastoral leader building a church. He had grit. When we tried to meet as a new church, Christ Church, we had to move, Ginny, I don't know, every six months. People kept kicking us out because we didn't think correctly. Also, you got to remember, as a friend of mine, a longtime roommate of mine, Greg Corcoran, he always said, remember your diggings. And that's an old you know, Boston Irish phrase, remember where you're from. Don't ever lose track of where you're from. Some people come from South Dakota, and they don't want anyone to ever know they're from South Dakota. I told everyone I was from Minnesota. I was proud of it. I kept my Minnesota driver's license. And when I wanted to come home and headhunters would call about jobs in Minnesota, do you know who they'd send them to? Me, because they knew that's the only one they knew from Minnesota. But your diggings are also your relationships, your family, the things that you, you grew up with, the things that have lasted over time. And don't forget friends and fellowship. I think in New York, it's really easy to go racing off after the next big thing. Another thing Tim Keller said, New York is just full of energy. Either you're grabbing energy from it, or it's sucking energy out of you, and there's very little middle ground. And don't lose track of that. My final thoughts are that uh, whether it's a startup, or whether it's journalism, or an entrepreneurial pursuit, people of faith are needed more than ever. Truth is more important than ever. And I really think journalism is more important than ever. Journalism's always been hard. People will pay a lot of attention to the current president who declares journalists are enemies of the people or the opposition party. But the previous president prosecuted more whistleblowers to journalists than the all previous presidents before him. So it hasn't been easy for a long time. Just because one person doesn't say it very nicely doesn't change the fact that being a journalist has been tough for a long time. And we need brave, good, and faithful people to pursue that.